Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation. I feel really honored to be in front of such a diverse and interesting audience. Uh, and what I'm going to present today is going to be mainly a paper that we've published in, in, May, in, in current biology. And, okay, this is very sensitive, so I'm going to step away a little bit from it. Okay. Um, and um, basically, I'm going to tell you our finding up front, and that is that beauty requires thought. Um, and I just want to start off maybe preaching a little bit to the choir here and saying that investigating beauty is important because beauty matters in many aspects of our every, everyday life. And it's not only the case that you know beauty sells and is a selling argument, or that um, beauty is an indicator or a predictor of success, being uh, be it in mating or in other kinds of everyday social interactions. Um, and even if you you don't care about money or uh, you know social status or hierarchies, um, then as researchers at least you have to acknowledge that there is a notion that. Beauty sort of is the first test. Beauty is an indicator of truth, with many mathematicians, physicians, um, physicists describing a good theory as being a beautiful theory. So beauty, broadly speaking, is something that we use to describe anything that is good, that has value to us. And um, so I'm interested in what are the processes and mechanisms that underlie our judgments of beauty. And um, well, we as psychologists and neuroscientists often think that we are inventing the wheel here with neuroaesthetics really for the first time investigating such a complex phenomenon. But truly, philosophers have been thinking about this and having had their theories about it for thousands of years. And so that's where I started looking for theories and basically found that um, there is this idea that beauty at its roots is a type of pleasure. And that is still being seen in contemporary dictionaries such as the uh, Merriam-Webster, pardon me, I'm uh, now living in an American country, and so that's my point of reference, where um, beauty is something that gives pleasure to the senses or pleasurably exalts the mind or spirit. Um, and as I've mentioned, uh, the notion of pleasure is also found in most philosophers who've been writing about beauty. And we still find the notion of pleasure in most psychological models of aesthetic appreciation. So um, that was the starting point of my investigation. But of course, the question arises, if beauty is just pleasure, well, why do we need a second term here? And so many philosophers have um, made qualifications to what kind of pleasure beauty is. And perhaps most famously, Immanuel Kant has made um, very specific qualifications to what kind of pleasure beauty is. And to boil it down to something that we can empirically investigate, um, you can sort of extract three very simplified hypotheses here, uh, which are first that the experience of beauty is one that requires thought, which shall be our main hypothesis for today. Uh, and second, kind of following from the first one, that the enjoyment of sensuous pleasures does not require thought, and that they, third, therefore, cannot be beautiful. And so we wanted to test these three hypotheses. And uh, in order to be able to do so, we needed a very diverse set of stimuli. And so we uh, picked stimuli that we thought should be beautiful. So firstly, we had our participant email us images that they themselves found beautiful without any restrictions on the content or what type of image they were supplying for us. Uh, then we were using uh, highly pleasurable images from the International Effective Picture System, uh, the IOPS that many of you might know. And we picked those with the highest valence ratings because we thought that this might be a good proxy for taking a good guess about what kind of images that are unfamiliar to participants will be beautiful to them with a high probability. And then we sort of had matching neutral plane images um, that we thought should probably not evoke a feeling of beauty. And those were, um, again, IFS images, but with a medium valence. So it's such like um, you know, really boring images of, of objects or pigeons or what have you. Uh, and also to have a little bit of variety here, we uh, went to the IKEA catalog and 
picked some of their most boring, basic, uh, cheap fur wood furniture. But then, right, we did not only want to make a distinction between beautiful and non-beautiful, we also want to make a distinction between uh, beautiful and sensuous pleasures. And so we were really thinking hard about um, what kind of pleasures are sensuous and would be sensuous in a Kantian sense and might have the um, uh, capacity to elicit very high pleasure. And what we ended up with using is uh, Jolly Rancher candies that our participants actually took in their mouth and, and sucked on them for 30 seconds. Um, they're very, very sweet, intense candies. And for Americans, many, many of them have very um, interesting childhood associations with them. And then we also went into uh, the modality of touch. So we bought a series of small alpaca teddy bears. And I can tell you, this is one of the softest and most addictive things I've ever touched. I used to keep one next to my desk, and it's, it's really hard to get your fingers off it. So highly pleasurable, but um, sensuous pleasures, right? So we would, we would not um, think usually that uh, there's a lot of higher cognitive activity um, associated with sucking a candy or, or stroking a, a teddy bear. So these were our stimuli. And uh, what we did with them is we uh, gave them to our participants for 30 seconds. So uh, sucking the candy for 30 seconds or touching the teddy bear in a pillowcase or looking at the images. And um, our participants were rating the pleasure they were experiencing from moment to moment as they were experiencing those stimuli with a um, touch screen application that we developed in our lab. It's called emotiontracker.com. It's completely free to use and open to you all to also use in the experience, uh, experiments if you like. And it allowed us to measure pleasure continuously over time while the stimulus was presented and another minute after the stimulus had gone away in order to track the fading of um, the pleasure experience from the object. And then at the very end of the trial, we also asked them, uh, did you get the feeling of beauty from the object earlier? And they read that on a very different scale, on a one, two, four um, verbal scale from definitely not to definitely yes. And I think Right, I, I will show you a little example of how Emotion Tracker works just to give you a little impression. The idea is very similar to what um, Ed was showing us yesterday evening in that we wanted to have an intuitive um, measure that people can, can use while they are looking at an image, but we chose finger spread because it does not um, necessitate you to ever look at the device in order to sense how big your rating is. So the instructions here, don't worry about it, I'll explain it to you. I know it goes too fast for you to, to be able to read it, are that um, you can indicate the maximum pleasure you're able to feel by spreading your fingers as wide apart as you can possibly maintain. And uh, you can indicate that you're feeling no pleasure at all by putting your fingers as close together as you can comfortably maintain. And then you're instructed to do so while you're watching and uh, looking at an image or stroking the teddy bear. Um, and what we, what we see then as a time course usually is that uh, people kind of quickly start to find their um, pleasure level for that particular experience and maintain that as long as the stimulus is maintained. But then when we take it away, there's sort of a, an exponential decay of that pleasure over time that um, then eventually converges to a, a minimal level at the very end of the one minute um, decay time that we're measuring it that is very close to the minimum they started off with. And then at the end, of course, they answer the beauty question and the trial is done. So the neat thing about this is, if I can get out of here, or maybe not, um, that this entire time course of pleasure turns out to be a very regular curve that does not differ that much between different stimulus types and also does not differ much between participants in that we always see a, um, an initial level that uh, asymptotically and exponentially approaches a stable 
state uh, that depends on the stimulus type and then decays over time after the stimulus has gone on to, um, again exponentially to a um, final um, response level. And the only thing that changes between trials, that changes between um, participants really, is this plateau level of um, pleasure. So uh, we can solve, not, I'm not showing that here, but we can solve analytically for um, an ideal, um, uh, for uh, finding a value for this plateau measure ending up with only one parameter describing the entire time course of pleasure for one trial. Um, and that allows us to boil down this extreme amount of data that we actually have for a time course um, to one pleasure value and then one beauty value at the end. And that's what we're working with for our experiments. But really, we're having this entire one and a half minute time course in mind and measured. Um, so again, we are having continuous pleasure ratings and a um, discrete beauty rating at the end of our trials. And now, um, of course, the question, this is all nice and fine, but how are we testing this idea of Kant that beauty actually requires thought? Uh, and we're using a very basic psychological idea, and that is if something is necessary for a process or mechanism to function, um, then it shouldn't function anymore when we take it away. So what we did in our experiments is that uh, we prevented our participants from being able to think about the stimulus by giving them an additional taxing and demanding task in 50% of the trials randomly assigned to each trial. Um, and the task that we chose is a so-called two-back task. So uh, it works as follows. A computer voice will read a string of letters to you um, every two seconds, one letter, and you are required to press a button or tell us um, whenever the letter is the same as two trials back. So you have to continuously memorize and update uh, two letters in your brain and um, do this comparison. Is it the same or a different letter from two trials back? So in this example, it's the sequence of C, K, Q, C, Q, Q. And so you're supposed to answer, yes, that's the same as two trials back on, on this queue here. It's very, very demanding. We tell our participants that they have to maintain at least 50% correct um, response rate. Uh, otherwise, they have to repeat the, the trial again. So they re And they're trained to do this task before we even start the experiment. Um, I'm no better than 80% ever in this task. I had an RA who did 100. Um, but this is really... Um, disengaging you from the stimulus, even though you're still having it physically in your mouth and underneath your fingers or right in front of you. So what does this prevention of thought do to our pleasure and beauty ratings? And the answer is um, that Kant was right. It, it seems to prevent beauty experiences. So on the very left here, I'm showing you again uh, the beautiful images, data of the beautiful images. The blue traces here are the pleasure ratings over time for um, trials in which participants were simply experiencing the images. And you see that pleasure rises very high consistently. And there's a big gap to the red traces. And those are the traces for trials where they had to, in addition to looking at the image, do the two-back task. So we see a, a huge decrease in, in pleasure for the beautiful images, no matter what is self-selected or from the IAPS database. Um, and we see no such difference for all of our non-beautiful stimuli, um, indicating that, yes, uh, beauty, experiencing beauty, something beautiful, does require thought. And if uh, thought is removed, we experience less of that beauty, less of that pleasure. But it doesn't really matter if you don't get to that level of pleasure or if you don't have the experience of beauty. Um, and just to complement the pleasure ratings here, we also see that in, in the beauty ratings. So there is a significant difference between trials with and without task, no matter how we ask about uh, the two-back task for the beautiful stimuli, but no such difference at all for either the sensor stimuli or the plain images. So um, all these findings uh, pretty much confirm Kant's hypothesis that beauty requires thought, but we also had to disconfirm for one of his statements, and namely that he claimed that sensuous pleasures can never be beautiful, something that surprised us as well, in that when we just looked at how often did participants tell us that 
uh, particular stimulus category was beautiful, we did find that there were actually quite a number of people, actually one third, that without the task claimed that uh, sucking the Jolly Rancher candy or touching that alpaca teddy bear is, yes, definitely beautiful to them. Um, and believe me, I followed up on, on those people and asked them, are you sure? Are you really sure that you want to say this is beautiful? And some of them were really taken aback about this criticism of, hey, this is my subjective experience. I just told you what you asked me. Um, and, and one of them, uh, I think, put it, put it down and just looked at me and said, anything, of course, anything can be beautiful. Um, and so uh, we are really taking these, these answers seriously, um, even though they're a matter of a lot of discussion about what, what the notion of beauty really should be. Um, but we think that this is actually disconfirming Kant's claim that, that sensuous pleasures can never be beautiful. Apparently, these people think that they can be beautiful and um, that's their subjective experience. Um, so uh, to, to start a little summary of our results here, um, we actually found that uh, when we look at the baseline level pleasure for the different kinds of stimuli and how much they were affected by adding the two-back task by preventing thought, uh, we find that there are some stimuli that have very low baseline pleasure and their pleasure is completely unaffected by the task. But the higher the pleasure um, without task, the baseline pleasure for each stimulus, the more these stimuli are affected by adding the two-back task. So um, the more of a decrease in pleasure we get when we take away thought from you. And so we think that this is actually an indication that there's something like a uh, pleasure threshold above which things do become beautiful. Um, meaning that maybe a good operational definition of, of beauty or me, maybe even a definition of beauty can be that it is a, an above threshold pleasure, a very high um, pleasure. So as a summary of this experiment, um, we found that uh, beauty increases linearly with pleasure. Um, data which I haven't shown you here in depth, but that I'm happy to show and follow up. Uh, we also found that strong pleasures are always beautiful uh, if they exceed a certain threshold. And that um, beauty is a special pleasure in that it does require thought. So these beauty experiences were diminished when we took uh, the ability to think away from our participants. And we also saw that beauty can be experienced from various objects, uh, including sensuous pleasures, as long as they exceed this, this kind of pleasure threshold. And um, I think I'm, I'm still good in time, so I wanted to go a little bit further and this kind of audience, because this is what, what we had published so far, but it um, really gave us this idea to build a model, a quantitative and mathematical model that links the experiences of pleasure and beauty together. So um, just backing up again, this idea that beauty is a type of pleasure that I started off in, in my talk and said that, well, it, it could be a special type of pleasure in that it requires thought, but then going back and saying, well, you know, what was really affected by uh, being able to think or not was actually a matter of whether it's highly or not so highly pleasurable. And I also uh, searched through all the, the literature quite a bit and found that um, beauty and pleasure are highly correlated actually throughout different studies, not only um, those are two graphs from our lab, this is the same study I've presented today, this is another um, large-scale study we did on MTURP with an image database of 900 images. Um, so the correlation coefficient is usually greater um, than 0.6 and usually on the order of 0.8 or 0.9. So it seems feasible to assume that, that beauty and pleasure are highly and linearly correlated with another. And that um, developed into an idea of our, in our lab of building a a model of the relation between pleasure and beauty, where at the core of it, actually, there's something like an underlying value um, that is shared across broader categories of stimuli, and that um, what the environment does is modulating the, the shape, the kind of distribution, and that both beauty and pleasure evaluations are, in the end, drawn from this one underlying value distribution. Um, 
such that both beauty and pleasure share an underlying common source that we might term value or that we might term um, aesthetic response or if you want valence, um, but are in the end derived from the same one and then just um, differ from one another in, in the variance between those two distributions. So um, just a little comic about what that means, you know, if, if I uh, see my, my new little sister here, a cute little puppy, that might be very certain that this is a highly enjoyable, highly beautiful stimulus for me with a very small variance. If I see the dirty street, a uh, different story, but on the lower end, or if I see a J Jackson Pollock, which I'm still not sure whether I like his art or not, not even after living two and a half years in New York, that might be a uh, you know, kind of medium distribution with a large variance that, that we draw from. And then what the environment might do is um, shift the entire distribution over or even squish it down and enlarge the variance depending on, on what kind of manipulation we're talking about. Um, and this is work that I'm, uh, that I'm actively still working on uh, with um, experiments on repeated measures that are trying to define whether there's, it's actually feasible to assume such one underlying source for both beauty and pleasure <laughs> or whether we're actually talking about parallel mechanisms going on here. So I'd be really thrilled to hear your thoughts on this um, and just want to conclude uh, saying again that we believe that beauty is a form of strong pleasure um, and that preventing thought prevents strong pleasure um, and, the ex and therefore the experience of beauty. Um, and just also want to end on a little quote by uh, Marcel Proust. He said that it's the possibility of pleasure that can be the beginning of beauty. And so thank you, and a special thanks to my supervisor, Dennis Pelly, and all the research assistants who've been um, helping me with data collection here, and Lauren Whale, who's done a lot of uh, initial development work on the emotion tracker. So, thanks. <laughs>